I'm coming to you live from Cairo, Egypt, which is where the Afrexim Bank is headquarters. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to the fifth annual Babakar in BIA lecture. Now this lecture series is one of the flagship events at Afrexim Bank, set up to honor a very great man and honor the legacy of this man, Dr. Babakar Ndiaye, who was a former president of the African Development Bank, extremely influential in the creation and establishment of this bank that you know today as the African Export Import Bank. Now, usually this event is held on the sidelines of the World Bank meetings over a five course dinner in the company of really great people. We make new friends, catch up with old friends. Um, but once again, this year, we're having to hold this event virtually as we begin to gradually get back to what our new normal is for physical gatherings. So I really do hope to see you all in person next year. But one thing is sure, this is still a gathering of great people like you, and we're really, really glad you're able to join us today. So over the years, we've had some of the best, most knowledgeable individuals and influential world figures at this event. And today is no exception. But firstly, I'd like to welcome the president of Afrexing Bank, Professor Benedict Orama, our executive vice president, managing director, and of course, the staff of Afrexing Bank. It's also my honor and my privilege to welcome our keynote speaker today, the former and first female president of Mauritius. I'm very proud of her for that too. Um, Her Excellency, Professor Amina Gurufakin. Thank you so much, ma'am, for being here with us today and accepting our invitation to be our keynote lecturer. We also want to welcome uh, Her Excellency, Professor Sarah Anyang Abor. She's the AU Commissioner for Human Resources, Science and Technology, who will also deliver her remarks today. Let me welcome members of our board of directors, ambassadors, members of diplomatic corps, shareholders, the Frexing Bank Spouses Network, and of course, all our distinguished guests from academia and beyond for joining us today. Thank you all so very much. Now, in case you haven't noticed, all of our speakers are professors and doctors, which makes me feel a little bit intimidated right now, I have to say, but that just tells you that we're really sitting amongst greatness. And it really is a privilege to hear from each and every one of them today. So quickly, I'm gonna go through some housekeeping items. Uh, We have interpretation, as you may have noticed, at the bottom of your screen, there is a bar where you can click on whichever language of your choice. We have interpretation in English, French, Arabic, and Portuguese. And for the hearing impaired, we have sign language as you should be able to see on your screen. There's also a chat box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to make comments, post any comments you have, let us know how the event is going. Of course, if you have questions, you can post them in the Q&A chat. We'll try to get to your questions. We have a tight schedule today, but we'll try to get to your questions during the Q&A. And of course, at the end of it, there is a quick survey, which I'd like to implore you to please fill out. Um, Once the event is over, you'll be served of that survey. Kindly fill it out, it'll take you just one minute and of course gives us a chance to bring you these events and make them bigger and better in the future. So I'll dive very quickly into um, our schedule for today. You already saw all the speakers that we have, so I won't run through the program, but I'm going to introduce um, our moderator for today as well. His name is Mr. Godfrey Matizwa, um, and he's no stranger to you all. He's editor-in-chief of CNBC Africa, which is a sub-Saharan, which is actually a sub-Saharan Africa's biggest television channel. He's covered African business affairs for the past 36 years. I'm sorry, Godfrey, I know I'm aging you again. (laughs) Uh, Across print and broadcast media, previously spent a decade with Bloomberg News and Reuters. In addition to his charge as the CNBC Africa's editor of CNBC Africa's editorial content, he also presents Closing Bell South Africa, which I'm sure many of you have watched on CNBC Africa. So coming to you live from South Africa, is Mr. Godfrey Mutizwa, my brother. I'm gonna pass the baton over to you and I'm gonna sit back and enjoy the rest of the program. Godfrey, you can hear me, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Adeze. I feel like singing that song by Eddie Grant called, Hello, 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 Africa. But I would be amiss because I have seen when I'm looking at uh, the people who have been able to join us here today, people from all over the world. So I'm going to say, Hello, Africa. Welcome to the fifth Baba Kandiaye lecture. Every year, the bank honors me by putting me on this huge pedestal where we are able to share very important and pertinent issues affecting the African continent. So I'm truly honored to be here. 
And I'm hoping that by the end of our session, we would have shared ideas that we are able to take into our spaces and spread far and wide around the continent and help to push our continent further along the road, including, of course, recovery from the pandemic. I'd like to begin first by just giving you an overview of uh, the speakers that we've got lined up for you. Uh, very shortly, uh, we're going to be listening to uh, a celebrated African poetry artist. And I say African, I've taken out the South African because she's truly African. I have met her in many places around the African continent. Lebo Mashile very shortly is going to be chatting to us. After she has presented, we're going to uh, be joined by the president of a Frexen Bank. Uh, Professor Benedict Orama, a man who has been driving the integration of Africa for a long time. Our keynote address, as you know today, is going to be delivered. I'm going to call her as they do the other former leaders in other parts of the world. So you hear of President Bush, you hear of uh, President Obama. So I'm going to call her uh, President Amina Gurib Fakim, former president of the Republic of Mauritius and a distinguished uh, leader within the space that we are talking about today. Technology, we're talking science, and we're talking, we're asking the question, how do we use to advance the African continent? And as you heard from Adese, before we go, we have a guest speaker, and uh, that will be Professor Sarah Anyang Agbo. She's going to give our closing remarks. So it promises to be a full program, and I'm hoping that all of you will be full uh, participants in the program uh, today. Okay, I wanted to also tell you that by the way, we are live on CNBC Africa, and I'm hoping that you will stay on to then watch the show that we will present after this program. I'm going to be presenting Closing Barrel South Africa, a wrap of the market movements here in uh, South Africa. And uh, unfortunately today, because this program is uh, overrunning, you won't be able to see Closing Bell West Africa. But if you tune in tomorrow, I promise you, it will be there and you'll be able to watch it. Let me tell you a little bit about our lady poet. Lebo, as uh, those who know her, uh, will describe it differently. Some will say she's a poet. Others will say she's a performer. Others will say she's a producer. She speaks. She's an activist. She's a social commentator. And she tackles those very thorny issues sometimes that we are a little embarrassed to talk about having been in over 29 uh, countries to date. She's the author of uh, the play Venus versus Modernity, uh, The Life of Sarti Bartman, 2019. She has won a Roma Award, and this is for her collection in A Ribbon of Rhythm, 2006, and Flying Above the Sky, 2008. Her acting credits include the film Hotel Rwanda, stage adaptations of Keller Sela Dukas, The Quiet Violence of Dreams, and Pamela Nomvedesnya, Nya Dancer, as well as the threads, a fusion of poetry and contemporary dance. Lebo has been around working within the television spaces and media for 18 years as a presenter, content creator, and voice artist. I could go on. Let's listen to her. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction, Godfrey. A warm welcome also from South Africa to all of our distinguished guests. I'd like to thank the Frexen Bank for continuing to support this, to support the arts, particularly poetry, especially at this difficult time um, of this global pandemic that we are contending with. I have written this poem for the occasion of the fifth annual Babaka Ndiaye Lecture, and it is my pleasure to share it with you. It's called Why We Are. There is no corner of the earth where we are not. No dimension of existence where we have not been. No experience of what it means to be human that has not been forged by our own DNA. To ask where we are going is to ask how we have arrived here. To ask who we are is to ask why we are. That is where our story begins. Why does our mineral rich soil make elements essential to the functioning of the modern economy while the first people of the planet remain disposable? Why are we dancing to a 500 year groove in a record that we did not design? 
when cartographers mapped the oceans and continents with the same patterns drawn on floors of homesteads with sand and dung, the same ground that swallowed the spilling of blood and the algebraic polyrhythms of griots, they were building a language that would be braided into African women's hair, carried on ships across the Atlantic, along with seeds, crowns of maps on black skulls, a message of survival to the future. We have been led to freedom by constellations in the minds of women, a true North Star. There can be no glory in the marketplace for Africa without women. She who carries timelines on her back and the cosmos within, whose sweat is the axis upon which the world spins, who illuminates the shadows where our light has been dimmed, who has birthed every dream of humanity, the mother of all skins. To ask who we are is to ask why we are. Innovation is our mother tongue. There are more pyramids in Sudan than in Egypt, more knowledge burned in the libraries of Alexandria than the scrolls of wisdom that have survived in Timbuktu. There are pyramids in Mexico, China, Egypt, Sudan, Peru, Spain, Italy, Guatemala, and Indonesia. Tridents of the soil running towards the clouds speak to a mathematical genius that has never been afforded to us. A scientific vision that has never been accorded to us. A technological mastery not associated with us. There are markings all over the world that tell of our footprints, from the crests of European cities depicting brown men to energetic synergies between Moorish architecture and the palpable intensity of flamenco dance. Our faces are in the children of Asia and Polynesia. We were explorers in the hands of the planet, helping her children to know themselves. Pyramids are technology. Art is technology. Genetics is technology. Ours is not to become something new. Ours is to fashion who we have always been anew. Science is the children of our villages inventing water purification systems, then studying at MIT and Harvard. It is the African child who created the algorithms for Snapchat and Instagram. It is the urgency driving the ascendancy of beats, connecting our hearts to dance floors in Soweto, Lagos, Nairobi, Kingston, and Brixton, providing the soundscape for human joy. But who will call this mathematics? Who will tell our choreographers that they are also physicists and astronomers, stretching the engineering of the body beyond the house of the soul to a living vessel for digital reverberations of the universe. There is nowhere where we are not. Our children do gymnastics on the partition between culture and technology, twisting its straightness into a sculpture, connecting us to every living element. How do we turn 419ers into cyber architects of tomorrow? How do we catalyze the essence of artistic abilities into robotic creativity? How do we mechanize our systems to leave the hands and the minds of our people free to educate themselves? Automation is not a threat where continuous learning is a culture. An educated population is not a threat when ethical servant leadership is a culture. A young population is not a threat when remembering why we are is a culture. Empowered women are not a threat when healed men are a culture. Being African is an applied science of humanity. We have been evolving since our first steps from the sea. Every tool we have made Every dream we have prayed is technology. Thank you.
Ah, wow. Where is the applause? I'm looking for the applause. Lebo, you are a true patriot of Africa. I don't know if you've been able to see all the comments that I was seeing on my screen here and they could keep on coming in and they're coming from all parts of the African continent. Wonderful, thank you, beautiful, illuminating. They go on and I thought I had words. I'm just finding my words are inadequate to describe the brilliance and uh, the strength of the message that you uh, sent to us. I wanted to quote a few of them here. So you uh, reminded me that we are the first people of the planet on the African continent. You reminded me uh, that on my mother's back, they are timelines of uh, the world. And uh, my mother is the mother of all skins across the African continent. We are explorers. Thank you uh, for that absolutely amazing message. We move on with the program. Let me introduce and contradict myself and introduce a man who needs no introduction. He is the president of uh, the Africa Export Import Bank, Professor Benedict Orama. Uh, Professor Orama has grown the bank significantly and improved its global appeal and relevance for the African continent. And I think it's a work that we all see around the African continent. The bank is playing a leading role in the implementation of our flagship program, the African Continental Free Trade Area, may I remind you, launched January 1 this year. Professor Orama is leading the creation and deployment of very innovative digital platforms that will boost intra-African regional trade and investments by revolutionizing cross-border payments. The bank is also improving access to quality trade information, a very important consideration given we don't know enough about ourselves. And within African countries, we don't know enough about the other African countries. As the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the African Union COVID-19 Response Fund, Professor Orama is helping to coordinate a grant mobilization and efficient utilization across Africa, as well as coordinating the procurement and distribution of medical supplies amongst African countries. Everybody is saying there will be no building back unless we conquer COVID. And we will conquer COVID if we all get vaccinated. An important message that we should be getting out every single day to those who continue to hesitate, to those who perhaps disagree, and to those who perhaps need that uh, persuasion. As a recognition of his achievements, Professor Orama has received several honors and awards, including his recent decoration by the President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, President of the Russian Federation, with the Russian Senate Award of the Order of Friendship in 2019. Also, in 2019, he was bestowed with the Knight of the National Order by the Cameroonian government. In the same year, he received an honorary Doctor of Science degree in Agricultural Economics from uh, Obafemi Awolowo University, Ife Ife, in Nigeria. In 2017, Professor Orama, if I may remind you, was voted African Banker of the Year by African Banker Magazine. Professor Orama, I could go on. We need uh, that book to be written quick and fast. Welcome, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, guest of honor, uh, Her Excellency Professor Amina Gurib Fakim, former president of the Republic of Mauritius, a world renowned scientist, and the 2007 laureate of the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science. Our special guest, Her Excellency Professor Sarah. I am Abo, Sister African Union Commissioner for Human Resources, Science and Technology. Honorable ministers here present, Your Excellencies, ambassadors and members of the diplomatic corps, governors of central banks, representatives of international organizations, captains of industry, distinguished representatives or shareholders of our Frexin Bank and members of the board of directors of the bank, executive vice president of our Frexin Bank, managing director of traffic and trade initiative at the bank, members of the board of directors of our Frexin Bank subsidiaries, our guest poet, uh, Lebo, who just dazzled us with a beautiful poem, management and staff of our Fresen Bank and its subsidiaries, ladies and gentlemen of, uh, gentlemen of the press, 
distinguished ladies and gentlemen. In my speech to Afrozimbal shareholders at their 26th annual meeting held in Moscow in June 2019, I reminded them that although political independence came to Africa six decades ago, the continent was in an epic struggle for economic emancipation. I underscored the critical success factors for the economic liberation struggle we were engaged in. I said, and I could, unlike the political struggle, the economic struggle will be fought and won differently. Instead of being trained, instead of being fought uh, with uh, uh, certain kinds of weapons, it has to be fought with brains. Instead of being trained in military camps, the freedom fighters for this new battle are being trained in technical schools and universities. Instead of fighting in trenches, this battle will be fought in factory floors and tech incubation centers. Instead of guns, the battle will be fought with ideas, hard work, and investments. While bravery was required for the political struggle, courage is a necessity for the economic liberation struggle. Technology are not armed gorillas, ideas are not bullets, will constitute the potent forces for victory in this new struggle. And as with political struggle, Africa needs partners that can support it to prevail. And the partnership we seek is one beyond aid and grants, but one founded on mutual respect and trust, win-win economic cooperation and pursuit of shared prosperity and excellence. I've repeated these arguments in speeches I've delivered to African students in Nigeria, the US and elsewhere. We've now decided to move from rhetorics to definitive action in spreading this message because we believe it is important. We have decided to begin the process of mainstreaming these arguments. And there can be no better platform to launch that process than our Babakan Diary lecture. That is why the theme of this year's lecture is the importance of science, innovation, and technology in the transformation of African economies under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It is undoubtedly a particularly important but challenging topic. That is why we had to search far and wide for somebody that fits the nexus of solid professional accomplishments Acuity of vision and strong political instincts. Uh, to this end, we didn't have, in the end, we didn't have to go too far. It is therefore my singular honor and privilege to welcome and thank our guest of honor, Her Excellency Professor Amina Gurib Fakim, for accepting our invitation as the keynote speaker for the fifth edition of the DIA lecture. We are most grateful to Your Excellency for rearranging your pressing engagements to be able to join us virtually today. After serving as the first female president of the Republic of Mauritius, you've also become the first female to deliver the Bakandaye annual keynote lecture. This is quite fitting because President Babaka Ndaye was instrumental in the rise of women to leadership positions at the African Development Bank. In this regard, I would like to thank you for allowing us to honor the vital aspect of this legacy. I welcome all our distinguished guests for finding the time to join us virtually once again. We're also grateful to our special guest, Her Excellency Professor Sarah Abo, the AU Commissioner for Science and Technology <clears throat> for finding the time to join us today. Is Lebo Mashile, a great African poet, is also graciously here with us and has already dazzled us. And we thank her for that. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Babakan Ndiaye lecture was launched five years ago by a Flexing Bank to honor Dr. Ndiaye's memory and sustain his vision of using strong continental institutions as instruments for delivering Africa's development and integration. 
At Fraser Bank was inspired by this vision and the relevance of the institutions he helped create while he was at the helm as the fifth president of the African Development Bank. His legacy is evident in the development impact those institutions have made over the years. A present bank stands today <clears throat> as an indisputable evidence of Dr. Of Diaye's foresight. And as Africa begins the implementation of the AFCFTA amid the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic, the urgency of giving more impetus to the struggle for economic independence has become inevitable. From Cape to Cairo and from Dakar to Dar es Salaam, Africans discovered the consequences of a huge deficit in manufacturing capacities, research, and development. As the COVID-19 induced nationalism spread across the globe, Africa was denied access to items from as simple as face masks to as complex as COVID-19 vaccines and ventilators, even with funding to pay upfront. There is now a widespread recognition across the continent that Africa's security cannot be guaranteed by current global relations of production and trade. Whereas the realization of the need to improve the technology content of Africa's production and trade had been there, it remained a fashionable rhetorical argument until the COVID-19 pandemic brought it home to all of us in fear and blood at the highest quarters. There's now a call to action to produce vaccines, pharmaceuticals, and build a viable intra-regional value chain on the platform of the AFCFTA. It is no wonder that African ministers of trade are doubling their efforts to quickly conclude negotiations of the rules of origin under the AFCFTA with a clear focus to use them as a basis to drive regional value chains and AFCFTA led industrialization on the continent. The role of science, innovation and technology in this process has firm theoretical and empirical foundations. In a world where trade has been dominated by manufactured goods, science, technology and innovation have become principal drivers of growth and global competitiveness. In fact, over the last few years, the power of science and technology has been demonstrated in a very profound way. For instance, abilities that kept Africa at the back of the vaccine queue. And if you look at company valuations today, you will find that Apple's 2020 market capitalization of $2 trillion was equal to the combined GDP of almost all African countries. And Apple is a technology company. According to the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Index, which measures the drivers of total factor productivity, the most competitive economies in the world are also the ones leading in the field of ICT, innovation, scientific research, and development. These countries are also the ones leading in the critical areas of energy transition, investments in skills needed for jobs in the markets of tomorrow, and are the ones expanding patient investment in research and innovation. The fifth NDIA lecture is holding the year trading commerce under the AFCFTA. The AFCFTA has been touted as a game changer because it has the potential to transform African economies and boost both intra and extra African trade. If corporations can take advantage of economies of scale associated with the free trade area. However, as, as significant and promising as it is for economic development in Africa, the AFCFT is a necessary and not sufficient condition for the effective transformation of African economies. Successful economic and industrial transformation that have eluded Africa for decades, a realization of the game-changing potential of the FCFTA hinge on overcoming several constraints. None is as critical as the cross-cutting issue of science, technology, and innovation. 
in essence, the question is no longer whether science, technology, and innovation are fundamental for the transformation of Africa and the implementation of the AFCFTA, but how to ensure that scientific research and technology adoption are expanded to accelerate the transformation we seek. The question is how to sustainably invest in science and technology to drive the transformation of African economies in a context of competing demands and resource constraints. How do we have our own Apple, Alibaba, BioNTech, Google, and so on? At the same time, the desired development objective of sustainably investing in science and technology is made even more challenging by political cycles where the urgent always trumps the most critical investment decisions. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, how do we ensure that science, technology, and innovation become an integral part of political decision-making processes across Africa and develop mechanisms to monitor progress in the promotion and mainstreaming of science and technology within the continent? Indeed, how do we help Africa return to its past glory so well described by uh, Lebo, and, but also described by Pedro Alvarez Cabral, a Portuguese nobleman, military commander, navigator, and explorer in 1500, when his voyage arrived in Kilwa, off the coast of present-day Tanzania. At the marvel of what he saw, he wrote, and I quote, this island is small near the mainland and it's a beautiful country. The houses are high like those of Spain. In this land, there are rich merchants and there is much gold and silver and mosques and pearls. Those of the land wear clothes of fine cotton and of silk and many fine things and they are black men. Another Portuguese seafarer, Lorenzo Pinto, visited the old Bene Kingdom in Nigeria and in astonishment, he wrote, and I quote again, Great Benin, where the king resides, is larger than Lisbon. All the streets run straight and as far as the eyes can see. The houses are large, especially that of the king, which is richly decorated and has fine columns. The city is wealthy and industrious. It is so well governed that theft is unknown and the people live in such security that they have no doors to their houses. So you see from the east to the west, and of course, the north, where more than 7,000 years ago, the pharaohs did so much wonder that this Egypt is regarded today as a cradle of civilization. Africa led the pack scientifically. But things have changed. So today, to help us unpack these 30 questions and articulate a new vision, we are science, innovation, and technology become the engine of Africa's economic growth and development. We could not have found a better person than our keynote speaker, High Excellency Professor Gurib Fakim, a politician who is also a world-renowned scientist. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the board of directors, management and staff of our Frexin Bank are most grateful to her for honoring us with her profound knowledge of these issues. We're also most thankful to Professor Sarah Ayangabo and Mrs. Lebo Mashile for joining us today. We are delighted, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to have with us today many participants, ranging from ministers, diplomats, bankers, corporate leaders, civil servants, leaders from the academia, representatives of the media and civil society organizations, and so on. 
we thank you very much. We are pleased that you could join us during this challenging period to sustain the legacy of a great African, Dr. Babakan Diaye. I'm also grateful to my colleagues who worked tirelessly to organize this event. Chief Economist will be speaking later and all uh, his team members who put all this together and made sure that working with our communications team and others from the bank, that we are able to have a smooth event. I thank you all for your attention and look forward to a very engaging session. Thank you, Professor Orama. I wanted to read you a message that has just come through from uh, Namibia here, where this uh, gentleman who just wrote in is thanking you for your uplifting uh, comments and uh, your recognition uh, of uh, African history and uh, the important work that lies ahead for all of us on the African uh, continent. Um, I wanted to begin uh, before I introduce Her Excellency by explaining that um, because her biography is so large, I'm going to do a disservice and not read all of it. But before I do that, I wanted to say, there's a reason why Africa is uncompetitive when it comes to inventing things and producing the goods that we require, be it in manufacturing or mining. We do not spend enough money and resources on research and development in part because we have not paid enough attention to the STEM subjects. And I think all of us know this. We are changing though, and today is but one example of that. The fifth Baba Kandiaya lecture is honored to host Her Excellency Amina Gurib Fakim, the first president, the first female president of Mauritius and a science doyen recognized all around the world. We well, thank you for being with us today. And I'm just going to give a few of the accolades and uh, the places where you have been at to share with our audience today. As I said, she was the first female president of Mauritius, 2015 to 2018. And prior to that, she was managing director of the Center for International Development Pharmaceutique Research and Innovation, as well as a professor of organic chemistry with an indoor chair at the University of Mauritius. Since 2001, she has served success, successively as Dean of the Faculty of Science and Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Surrey, UK, PhD from University of Exeter, at which she began working at the University of Mauritius. Between 1987 and 1992, she served as project leader for the first regional research project on the inventory and study of medicinal and aromatic plants of the Indian Ocean, funded by the European Development Fund. And so the list goes and on and on and on. Your Excellency, allow me to cut short that introduction and take you to the floor. And thank you once again for joining us this afternoon and sharing your immense knowledge. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it is an honor and a great privilege to be delivering the fifth annual Babaka and the I lecture to such a distinguished community and audience. I would like to thank Professor Benedict Orama, President of the Afraxin Bank, and Dr. Hippolyte Fokak for associating me with this important event. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa starts with a considerable deficit in spite of its natural advantage and huge asset endowment. The continent of ours is about 30 million square kilometer, representing 20% of the Earth's surface. She is home to 1.3 billion people, representing 17% of global population, targeting 2.5 billion by 2050, and also home to swathe of forest, minerals, among so many riches. Yet, the continent produces only 3% of global GDP, accounts for less than 3% of global trade, and most of it is dominated by primary commodities and natural resources and carries 25% of the global disease burden, accounts for only 2% of world research output, 1.3% of research spending, and 0.1% of patents. How can a continent 
with the largest share of the world's arable land, 60%, a continent with the youngest population, a continent that has fueled all of the world's industrial revolution, a continent that has helped drive the mobile phone industry, a continent that is at the cusp of supporting the world's energy transition to greener technology with a large store of rare earth mineral deposit, except such dismal statistics. Our challenges, ladies and gentlemen, are fundamental and structural. The deficit of investment in science and technology and absence of economic and scientific infrastructure for innovation have undermined the process of economic transformation, both at the structural level, shift of workers and resources from low to higher productivity sectors, and at the sectoral level, the growth of productivity within sectors. The consequences of that deficit have been significant and include continued reliance on the colonial development model of resource extraction, largely responsible for the debilitating poverty trap and aid dependency trap. But these challenges have been compounded by economic fragmentation with smaller markets constraining long-term investment and injection of patient capital to foster innovation and drive technology transfer in the context of globalization. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement, AFCFTA, which defragments Africa to establish the largest single market in the world by membership and created the conditions for safe or scale also lifts one of the most important constraints on the path of economic transformation. By meeting that challenge of economic transformation, a development objective that has eluded Africa for decades in the AFCFTA era hinges on Africa closing its scientific and technological gap with the rest of the world and sustainably producing the right set of skills to address the supply side constraint and ultimately expand both extra and intra-African trade and sustain higher rates of growth to accelerate the process of global income convergence. Currently, we have a public education system that prescribes rote learning rather than the independent critical analysis and thinking that is needed to succeed in knowledge intensive economies. That system has neglected the sciences, which have, ha which have been the major drivers of growth and innovation for decades. Just a few statistics for illustration. According to the World Intellectual Property Indicators 2020, offices located in Africa receive 0.5% of all patent application filed worldwide, compared to 65% in Asia, 20.4% in North America, and 11.3% in Europe. According to UNESCO, Sub-Saharan Africa was home to only 0.7% of world's researchers as of 2018, representing 14% of the global population. 13 out of the 20 underperformers in terms of research per million of people are based in Africa, with as little as 11 researchers per million people for the worst performers, and most, this is of course the most recent data, in comparison, outperformers such as Denmark, Sweden, Korea, respectively, have 8,066, 7,980, 7,536 researchers per million people. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest dream of most African graduates is to find a job instead of fostering entrepreneurship and drawing on their creativity and animal spirit to find solution to economically rewarding problems. And we have so many across our continent. In the medical and pharmaceutical industry and the COVID-19 crisis has shown in the housing and urban development as our cities illustrate, in the climate space as our excessive reliance on import of refrigerators and air conditioning illustrate, in the energy sector, the chronic deficit of power across the continent including in South Africa, the most sophisticated economy in the region illustrate. However, 
the AFCFTA that aims to unlock manufacturing potential, drawing on the rules of origin to facilitate industrialization, driving sustainable growth and jobs, among other objectives, will need a different set of skills to fully deliver on its full transformational power. The key boon of manufacturing is that it absorbs large swathes of workers and places them into productive and decent paying jobs. Throughout history, this exact recipe has transformed the United States, United Kingdom, France, Japan, Germany into some of the world's wealthiest nations. Most recently, a new age of industrialization has helped push China into one of the world's fastest growing economies, boasting the largest middle class with other Southeast Asian countries following closely behind. These are all examples of how industrialization can generate rapid structural change, drive development, and alleviate poverty and unemployment. However, this narrative seems to exclude many African nations. Despite the manufacturing potential and promising trajectories, most African countries have remained largely dearth of factories. This limited industrial development represents a missed opportunity for economic transformation, characterized by the expansion of manufacturing output in a context of a strategic shift of workers and resources from low to higher productivity sectors through the more entry and growth of technologically intensive firms and sustained effort to foster innovation in the higher productivity sectors. The silver lining is the potential. Business to business spending in manufacturing in Africa is projected to reach 666.3 billion US dollars by 2030, 201.28 billion more than it did in 2015. Africa is also set to become the great manufacturing center, potentially capturing part of the 100 million labor intensive manufacturing jobs that will leave China by 2030. This trend creates a huge opportunity for the continent, not only for countries such as South Africa, Egypt, and Nigeria, all regional art performers in the Global Manufacturing Competitiveness Index, but also for new players such as Ethiopia, Morocco, Rwanda, and others, all of whom have recently adopted policies enabling manufacturing and industrial development. Today, leaders are increasingly realizing that manufacturing is a major factor in helping Africa realize its development potential and narrow its income and welfare gap with other regions of the world. The African Union has made industrialization and export diversification the centerpiece of its strategy, Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. African governments are seeking new and innovative ways to attract investment and nurture industry, implementing strategies that involve targeted investment in infrastructure, improve regional integration, and the establishment of special economic zone for priority subsectors. Under the second pillar of its fifth strategic plan, the African Export Import Bank is financing the development and expansion of industrial parks and special economic zones. It is also supporting the development of regional value chains to sustainably foster technology transfer. However, in order to reach its manufacturing and industrial potential, much needs to be done by the public and private sectors to increase Africa's economic complexity, diversity, competitiveness, and productivity. After all, to reverse the trend and to compete in an intensely globalized world, we need to take a big leap forward fueled by innovation. We also need an innovation system that can deliver new manufacturing technologies and processes to get us there. Ladies and gentlemen, at a macroeconomic level, countries across Africa are chronically dependent on aid and urgently need to turn the attention to attractive business, private investment and venture capital and marshalling innovation. But it is not all doom and doom. Africa has the youngest population of any continent. According to the World Economic Forum, the median age among the 10 youngest countries on the continent range from age 14 to 18. 
we ignore this significant demographic asset at our peril. These inexorable trend trends mean that by 2034, Africa will be home to the world's largest number of working age adults. The World Bank estimates that 11 to 15% GDP growth over the next 20 years will be attributable to these favorable demographics. The energy is palpable with world-class innovation emerging from technology incubators in cities from Kigali to Harare to Lagos. Ladies and gentlemen, as we explore the best strategies to build and sustain research and development capacity for Africa's economic growth and economic and social well-being, we need to look anew at how science, technology, innovation can be better mobilized to propel us in our journey to achieving the UN SDGs by 2030 and the Africa Union Commission's agenda 2063. Fortunately, there are many nascent success stories that we can draw upon and that need to be replicated speedily at scale. In certain technologies, in certain sectors of technology entrepreneurship and application, we know that we are pivoting to a better place. The energy is palpable. We see this most prominently in telecommunications. In 2006, according to The Economist, there were fewer than 13 million landlines and 130 million subscriptions to mobile phones in all of Africa. Today, over a billion of the continents, 1.4 billion people have access to mobile phone. These in turn have served as a platform for innovation and in the efficient delivery of services. Of particular note, of financial services and mobile money initially developed in East Africa and spreading across the continent. Across Sub-Saharan Africa, relatively few people have traditionally qualified for bank accounts, but today everything from bananas in the marketplace to software for our PCs is purchased through the mobile money platform created in Kenya and PESA. A Frexim Bank Pan-African Payments and Settlement System which is set to facilitate payments for cross-border trade in African currencies will not only assuage the liquidity constraint, it will also push the boundaries of efficiency and productivity at the continent level with significant implications for growth and structural transformation. Indeed, the GSMA, the International Telecommunication Trade Organization notes that for every 10% increase in, in phone penetration in poor countries, productivity improves by more than 4% percentage point, and that a doubling in mobile data usage increases annual per capita GDP growth by half a percentage point. Ladies and gentlemen, MCOPA is an energy startup built in the, on the mobile money platform, M-PESA, enabling families to purchase clean home energy in payment as small as 50 cents. MCOPA brings solar energy to more than 500 new households every day, totaling over half a million East African homes that were previously unreached by power lines. With only one in three Africans having access to energy, energy security is crucial to fighting poverty, improving productivity, sustaining the growth of output, especially industrial output, and nurturing the next generation of scientists. Together, these families receive over 60.5 million hours of clean solar energy per month through this technology. And as a business enterprise and contributor to the economy, MCOPA has raised well over $50 million in venture capital, providing full-time jobs to over 1,000 people and retaining over 1,500 sales agents. Paradoxically, a big factor in exemplary and appropriate technology successes, such as MCOPA, is that in many cases, we do not carry the burden of entrenched industries with vested financial interest that perpetuate business as usual, the large number of unbanked people leading to mobile-based financial services. The absence of an energy grid in rural communities invites solar energy solutions, such as MCOPA. The absence of investment telephone lines clears the path for adoption of mobile telephony and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, as these few success stories show, there is greater recognition about the role of STI can play 
in achieving national development goals and challenge is to maintain this momentum. Shining example of world-class innovation in Africa are emerging, for example, from technology incubators, creating techies across the continent. As a result, Africa is attracting actual capital investment necessary to build industry that is sustainable in the long term, rather than further cultivating aid dependence, which by its nature is short term and has never led to either the development or structural transformation of any region or country. Whether in the realm of energy, banking, communication, medicine, agriculture and irrigation, transport or manufacturing, the major drivers of growth and productivity gains have been in science, technology and innovation. And innovation, which is increasingly treated as a deliberate outgrowth of investment in industrial research by forward-looking and profit-seeking agents has become a major piece of the economic transformation puzzle. In fact, since the 1970s, the world has moved from organization change-driven growth to technological change-driven growth. No wonder the largest corporation and companies on Wall Street have, be have become tech companies. The five biggest companies, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Parent, Alphabet, and Facebook, account for 23.8% of the SP500 index. Technology has produced more billionaires over the last 20 years than the total number of billionaires produced in the 50 years which followed the end of World War II. And looking ahead, the power of science technology as drivers of growth and global competitiveness is irreversible. Clearly, the link between science, technology, innovation and economic transformation, whether at the structural or sectoral level is overwhelming. The key policy is what are the, the key question is what are the policies, skills, and contours of the scientific ecosystem that will foster sustainable, gr sustainable growth of scientific and technological innovation to sustain and accelerate the process of economic transformation. Our collective mission must be as simple as it should be compelling boosting basic scientific research and development capacities, unleashing innovation, catalyzing change, and forging the next generation of partnership will all accelerate the transformation of African economies for greater export diversification and expansion of both extra and intra-Africa trade in a world where manufactured goods have consistently been a growing share of global trade and now accounts for over 85% of world trade. We must establish the proof of principle that world-class Pan-African science and innovation can be mobilized for tackling Africa's deep and entrenched development challenges led by Africans in Africa, with priorities set by Africa for Africa in strong partnership with the international community in this way. Africa can claim its rightful place as a global driver of prosperity for the benefit of all. How can we contribute to tackling our challenges? By building dramatically scaled up infrastructure for research, help, help create the right policy environment and supporting sound governance of institutions, and most of all, investing and unleashing the scientific capacity of people, not forgetting women. We know the best trained, most talented researchers naturally gravitate to environments where their work is leveraged by modern equipment, reliable utilities, and sufficient funding for supplies. And more critically, benefiting from the presence of other talented people. Africa's brain drain must be transformed into Africa's brain gain by creating a research infrastructure that rivals the best in the world right here at home. We must thoughtfully construct a strong foundation to train and retain our best talents, making Africa an inviting home for African research by African and international researchers. Only success will beget success. The aim is for Africa-centric investment to create a virtuous cycle of talent, attracting talent, boosting training, and working to retain the trained talent to tackle Africa's development challenges and sustain the process 
of economic transformation over time. Once we build this element for sustainable science, technology, innovation environment, it will become the engine that powers our transition to a new environment where the increasing rate of economic sophistication is enhancing effective integration into global value chain for a robust and sustained economic growth, as well as greater prosperity, less disease, and more scientific independence in Africa. At the same time, we must be realistic about the magnitude of our aspirations. Every step in the research ladder must be systematically reinforced. For example, today world-class postdoctoral fellowship in African laboratories are virtually non-existent. Forcing our new PhDs with the greatest potential to seek training overseas, many of whom end up contributing to the proverbial brain drain. This is a collective loss to major subsidies to the new host country often more industrial economies, which are always very quick to, trump, to trumpet their generosity under the debilitating aid dependent model. We must rise to the challenge by creating research universities capable of not only producing world-class science, but also serving as training incubators at the graduate and postdoc levels. Ladies and gentlemen, a thriving research establishment requires a critical mass of postdoc researchers who can not only dedicate the time to in-depth research, but also provide guidance and practical training to aspiring graduate students. Universities that aspire to become competitive research institutions must attract the best trained PhD holders from everywhere in the world as postdoc to reinforce a critical thinking in the research chain, which will be an essential contributor to driving innovative outputs from these institutions. In order to recruit and retain this level of talent to create a critical mass of independent African researchers, leaders, sustained funding and infrastructure, including the most modern equipment must be provided. These steps require not only research training and resources, but also the capacity to engage successfully with fellow researchers, funders, government, policymakers, communities, and other stakeholders to serve as mentors and supervisors for the next generation of scientists in Africa. Our financial goal must be easy as we need to raise funds from both the public and the private sector, a manifestation of the UN SDGs, a master plan for ending poverty, protecting the planet and ensuring that people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. The public part of this investment is manifest in the commitment of African nations to dedicate 1% of their GDP to research and development. Although the continent is far from achieving this ambitious target, the goal itself validated the belief that investment in Africa by Africa herself is essential to long-term prosperity. <clears throat> the challenges are multifaceted. There are many moving parts. Our wealth, prosperity, sit at the nexus of not just the interdependent, transdisciplinary nature of health research and our ability to and willingness to share our research outcome openly and transparently, but also in the broader context at the intersection of nutrition, health, agriculture, environment, governance, and the economy. But it can be done because it must be done. Our ability to create sustained future for ourselves isn't optional, it's existential. It may seem overwhelming, but there's an African proverb that says, if you wish to move mountains tomorrow, you must start by lifting stones today. Those dedicated to building a thriving, self-sustaining Africa, where science is the new lifeblood of economic transformation in our beloved continent, are invited to bring their stone so that we can move mountains together. Starting with politicians and bankers who hold the purse, and then every young African who has the potential to be a great scientist, must work hard to realize its potential for the benefit of the continent and humanity. And then the private sector must rely on African scientists to innovate and to become globally competitive to sustain the transformation of African economies. And then over time, and through a vibrant public-private partnership for economic transformation supported by African scientists, the process of continued innovation and scientific will expand the power of Africa's purse and reduce its excessive dependency 
on external debt financing, but creating an ecosystem where the scientific culture becomes central to economic transformation policy making decision process is a long term investment and should not be affected by either political or business cycle. Hence, to achieve a success in the path of economic transformation, effective collaboration under the tripartite public private academia partnership for economic transformation in the FCFTA era must be sustained over time. As part of my ongoing effort to use my bully pulpit for advancing the cause of STI, I contributed an op-ed in Nature, calling for a greater push to mobilize the end up potential of indigenous African plants to generate growth and the next generation of drugs and pharmaceuticals for tackling Africa's disease and promoting health and well-being on the continent. The overall purpose is to provide a, use, a useful illustration of how strategic investment in Africa's capacity for research and development can return big a human and financial dividends and expand potential in the health and pharmaceutical industries, which are growth industries in Africa with tremendous potential for economic transformation. I'm pleased to know that the African Import Export Bank, our trade finance bank, is playing an increasingly important role in this critical plan pan of our economy, financing the emergence of medical centers of excellence and the rise of a vibrant pharmaceutical industry. Ladies and gentlemen, today, 60% of commercially available drugs are based on molecules derived from natural sources. As an organic chemist and biodiversity scientist, I see the great significance of this fact, especially when we consider that 25% of all plant genetic resources reside in Africa. Yet, of the 1,100 drugs marketed globally that are derived from plants, only 83 are synthesized for African species. We have left 45,000 plant species unexplored for their potential to serve as the molecular basis of pharmaceuticals and underdeveloped to potentially alleviate human suffering and drive economic prosperity for Africa. Moreover, we are in a race, we are in a race against time. Species are disappearing fast because of climate change, habitat loss, development, and other pressures. Sadly, the extinction rate of plant species on the continent is almost twice the global average, and this must be reversed. Financial commitment to exploiting opportunities to develop drugs is necessary, but not sufficient. It also requires technical, legal, regulatory, cultural conditions to enable and nurture development. Complicating matters, traditional information about the uses of plants is usually transmitted orally rather than cataloged and indexed formally. And recipes are considered trade and family secrets and so are unlikely to be shared. As an African proverb says, an elderly person's death can be like a library that is burned to the ground. For too long, we have underestimated and undervalued indigenous knowledge about our flora and fauna, yet, that knowledge can be a major catalyst for endogenous growth and sectoral transformation in a continent that is spending more than 16 billion US dollars annually on import of drugs and pharmaceutical products. Other developing countries are tackling this challenge in different ways. India has established the Ayush Ministry dedicated to the development of indigenous medical plants and systems. China is working with the WHO to catalog and document in English species commonly used in Eastern medicine. China and India are large countries compared to tiny Mauritius, but the challenges of conservation transcend national boundaries. Even though Mauritius and nearby islands are designated as biodiversity hotspots, almost 100 species have become extinct since the arrival of people in the 17th century, and less than 2% of the native forests remain. With the right set of priorities, even small countries like Mauritius can punch above their size by recognizing the potential of scientific research and development. To this end, I helped found what is now the Centre International pour le développement pharmaceutique, which looks for innovative ingredient for our local species, from our local species, and bring them up to international standards for further development. There are several success stories of knowledge that is crossing the valley of death from lab bench 
to marketplace due to such efforts. A recipe from the sand people in Southern Africa has led to standardized extracts of the plant Skeletium tortuosum to be tested for their tranquilizing properties. Other extracts of African plants, including nuts of the shea tree, seed oil of the baobab, are used commercially across the globe in skin and beauty products. The challenge for ambitious initiative is to spread investment-worthy ideas more widely across the continent and in various industries and sectors so that the process of economic transformation is broad-based, and I'm convinced that catalyzing greater collaboration will hold the keys to success. There is an African proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. I hope we can bring many seedlings and shovels and plant many trees that will flower together, nurtured by the best scientific knowledge available and talents of Africa. It can be done as responsible stewards of the earth and specifically for our beloved continent. It must be done so that the benefits of STI are marshaled for greater economic, social, environmental sustainability, both on the continent and beyond. I thank you for your attention. Professor Fakim, thank you very much. Um, I tried to look on my machine to see if I could see uh, a little button that would help me to release some artificial applause button I couldn't see. So I'm hoping that in your private spaces, you can join me in uh, saying thank you very much and giving her the applause that she deserves for that very incisive talk. I will not even attempt to try to uh, capture the essence of what she said, but I did notice that she said, you, the politicians, need to work on policy. You, the bankers, need to fund this. And you, the private sector, need to create the environment for innovation that enables the use of uh, all of these things that we have within our space, the indigenous knowledge that we flush every single year, the export of our, our own talent here from the African continent. But I will not take up too much of the time because there are many questions that I see coming through and uh, we will try to accommodate as many of those questions as we can. One of the key points I, key, I see key, that keep coming back is people are asking the question, where can we see this? Please share this. I am certain that uh, the organizers will be able to share this and this is being recorded and uh, this uh, lecture is going to be shared widely. Uh, Professor uh, Amina Gurib Fakim, again, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to start with a question that I have here very quickly before we move on. Now, we did hear from President uh, Benedicto Rama talking about science and technology and talking about its neglect on the African continent. And one of those spaces where it is neglected is within national uh, budgets. So, Your Excellency, you're a former uh, president. You're a scientist. So the question that comes to you is, how do we prioritize the sector so that we are able to begin the process of transformation and the use of the indigenous knowledge and resources that you referred to, not 20 years ago, as you said, but today, so that we begin planting that tree. Thank you, uh, Godfrey, for this question. Uh, this is, unfortunately, as I mentioned in the lecture, an area which has been grossly neglected. This is an area that can, to me, provide the third way when we look at adaptation to a changing climate. This is an area that can provide medication, cheap, affordable, uh, socially and uh, culturally acceptable. This is an area that can provide food security. And unfortunately, every time an elderly passes on, we lose a library. So what I started by doing myself is that uh, I documented and uh, this documentation is very important. It needs to be there at WIPO in the library. And we need to start looking at these recipes that can then be framed within the scientific framework so that it can provide solutions to our everyday problems. And this, of course, is a way of creating jobs because by so doing, you become an entrepreneur. And this is exactly what we want the African youth to become, to become a highly innovative and a highly inventive and a highly motivated entrepreneur with the resources available on the continent. As I said, agenda set by Africans for Africa in Africa, but of course with strong partnership. 
I'm taking that message and I'm going to put it this way. You are saying this begins with every single one of us. We begin by making sure that we capture that knowledge uh, before we lose our libraries in our homes, in our spaces everywhere. Let me take some more questions here that I am seeing. This is a question from Mohammed. He says, Professor Amina, we are inspired and totally convinced of your prepositions to the clear need for direction, research and development, uh, science and technology, and more investment in resource rich Africa. Where do we start the revolutionary step? But I think we've already answered that. Which of our stakeholders should begin the tasks? I think we've also answered that. So I'll move on quickly and uh, ask if I can get another question here. Um, okay, there were some other people who were talking about other things that are slightly uh, off topic. So I'm going to ignore them because here we are talking about trying to advance this. Okay, so this is Tony. Tony is uh, with the East Africa Entrepreneurs Association. He's attending. He thanks the, uh, your, your, your Excellency for that wonderful presentation and requests that this be shared. Again, this is a suggestion that this be shared. I want to move on quickly here. Uh, please do share Prof. Oh, no. There are a lot of... Do you see? They want to... Uh, that this must be uh, shared as widely as we can. So I'm scrolling down and trying to see if I can find uh, a question uh, that, can, uh, 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 that you can uh, uh, refer to you. I am not seeing questions. All I'm seeing is praise, Prof. All I'm seeing is praise. Okay. While I'm uh, going through those uh, 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 questions, let me give you another question that I have here. Right. Now, the success of the AFCFTA will greatly expand opportunities, including growth opportunities for major banks and financial institutions, such as the Frexin Bank. Uh, we did hear the, about the link between science and technology and that it is probably why we are having this event. Is there a role for banks in the new continental crusade for scientific renaissance, Your Excellency. Thank you. I think already the AFCFTA is providing a huge platform uh, for market because we, we already want to see promoting uh, intra-Africa trade because we are targeting 1.3 billion uh, uh, you know, people who can actually uh, use the existing resources from within the continent. Uh, by promoting um, uh, science, technology, innovation, I see one sector already, which is manufacturing. I think this is again where uh, the bank has a key role to play. The bank has already started playing a key role in the innovation sector uh, by creating, as I said, medical centers. And I think this is already a start. But we have to do is identify some of the key sectors of the key region where we can promote excellence by virtue of the work which is already going on there. And by developing the centers of excellence on key area, be it on health, agriculture, you know, industrial transformation, we should be able to, to make a very good start on encouraging the private sector bank, of course, academia and the researchers to come together around these key centers of excellence and really drive the research and science and technology agenda of the continent. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. I've got another question here. It comes from Cher Romanus, and uh, this goes, how can we reconcile globalization and African nationalism? Uh, Professor Orama, I'll also ask you to chip in here. Globalization, uh, it's been happening all the time. And uh, I think what we'll have to do is rethink globalization so that it, uh, it works for everyone. And uh, rethink globalization in terms of bringing on board our regulatory organizations and our bringing the government. Because so far, what we have seen is a kind of abdication from the regulators to look at ways and means of ensuring that globalization works for everyone, for all organizations, for all institutions. But globalization is here. We, we just need to relook at the, the tools, relook at the, uh, the, the entire system so that it keeps working for everybody. Nationalism, that's another debate. And uh, we have seen how nativistic approaches and how nationalism uh, in, the, in the worst side of, of, the, of, of the way it's approached is done has been destructive. So I am for partnership, I'm for exchange. I am very much for uh, the free trade agreement which has been signed through the continent so that we can bring the best for all uh, stakeholders and of course the best for our, for our people. Sarama. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think uh, let me add my voice uh, in uh, congratulating uh, 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 President uh, Garib for uh, a very insightful uh, presentation that explored all the contours of the subject. 
uh, that <clears throat> we have here today. Uh, I think uh, it's very, very thought provoking and provides a platform for us to think and see uh, what we can make of some of the suggestions uh, that have been uh, put forward. Uh, regarding the African nationalism and globalization, I think the fact is that Africa has been left behind in globalization. Africa is marginalized um, in globalization. Um, and what we are seeing today uh, is that globalization helped Asia, certainly helped China. Um, and all of a sudden, too, the West are beginning to see that, or some of the people in the West are beginning to be anti-globalization. Um, I'm blaming uh, China for everything. Uh, but I think the issue, what has happened is the way globalization has been implemented. Uh, globalization in its purest uh, sense uh, requires the, the free movement of all factors of production and goods. Uh, but uh, the globalization that was pursued or is being pursued is one that free the movement of goods, movement of uh, capital movement, but not movement of labor. Uh, and I think that is why you have the kind of the discontent that is beginning to emerge in the West. Now, I say this um, in the context of the AFCFTA. Uh, what it tells me is that we have to globalize our continent first. So we, we need to all uh, uh, come together under the AFCFTA and build a, a very strong supply chain. And in the context of that, uh, move up in terms of uh, building comparative, dynamic comparative advantage in producing the kinds of goods that can go to global markets. When we're able to then build it, we will be able to compete effectively uh, in the world and um, in the global markets. Uh, the, the, there's no doubt, as Prof has said, that globalization is there to stay. There are so many good things, no matter what we want. Uh, it has helped everybody. Uh, one way or the other. Uh, it is there to stay, maybe reformed in, one, in some ways to fit or suit uh, the purpose of those uh, who feel they are shortchanged. Uh, but it is there to stay. But to get into the global market, you have to be really competitive. And for Africa to be competitive, we have to deal with the atomistic, fragmented markets we have today. And uh, also uh, small countries who pull together to be able to produce. Uh, competitively and then compete in that global market. Thank you. And that is a point that has been uh, endorsed here by uh, Asna uh, Ben said. He says, uh, uh, given that uh, resources are limited, uh, do countries need to join forces to build these centers of excellence, e.g. Madagascar and Mauritius? I'll take that as a comment. There's another comment here. Edmo Mangisi says, totally agree with documentation and we need issues that tackle behavioral aspects as is a key game changer. The question that I have comes from Mashud Bade. Thanks for a very inspiring lecture, but what is your view on global validation and acceptance of medical inventions? Global validation, I mean, this is again rest with the power of institutions. And uh, this is why we need to have a strong, again, regulatory body uh, in Africa, completely aligned with what's happening elsewhere. Uh, so if we already have started with um, uh, the agency, the, the medical agency uh, in Africa, we have the Africa CDC, which is working closely with many other parallel institutions uh, uh, globally. So what we'll have to do is to increase validation is again, this notion of strong partnership, but of course we have to strengthen our own institutions and we have to keep on building trust in our institutions. And this is something, unfortunately, uh, we have seen by virtue of the weakness of our institution, we have lost the trust of so many people. It may be in health, it may be in many other sectors. So the idea is to keep on building and reinforcing our institution so that it really becomes a very strong pillar to, to which our people can look up to. Thank you very much. I want to apologize to the majority, really, because there are so many questions here and uh, 
comments that are being made, and I will simply not be able to get to them. But this, uh, this, this session is being recorded, and uh, I am sure the organizers will be able to share this. Victoria from Obafemi, Obafemi Aolo University. Thanks, Prof, for your presentation. You mentioned the tripod stand, public, private, and academia to date. Uh, there is no synergy between the three in most parts of Africa. And as you mentioned, this is key. Where do we go from here? How do we actualize this? At the level of uh, universities, I think um, uh, whenever uh, I just come uh, kind of very micro here, if we are crafting um, a, a new syllabus, this is where we need to bring in the private, the private sector so they can have the say on the employability and the orientation of that particular course. So this has to be driven by the government, by the, by the agency responsible for higher education, and they need to encourage this dialogue so that whatever is being produced or generated from that institution is still fit for purpose. And unfortunately, this is again where we are weak. We haven't encouraged this dialogue between the academic sector, private sector, and also the public sector, because uh, we need these advisories, we need this conversation so that our courses and the output, the graduates, they are all fit for purpose for the, for the new work environment. Prof, uh, do you want to add in there in terms of uh, making those three, as, they, as, as it's been called, that tripod working together better? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, oh, sorry. No, 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 carry on. <laughs> sorry. Okay, I don't know what I, 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 is Two it profs me? in the room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, if you uh, add, uh, uh, do you want me to go ahead? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, that is uh, really, uh, that was a very, very sad foot in the tripartite. Uh, you see, uh, the way we see it at the bank uh, is very, very close to what uh, our keynote speaker uh, has postulated. The problem we have in Africa is that uh, scientific research uh, is not seen from a business perspective. So a scientist uh, is somebody who uh, achieves fame by discovering something that nobody has ever seen. But taking it away, taking it from there to become something, a business proposition, whether scientist becomes a billionaire is not, uh, is not what we have on the continent. And that is why we are not having con countries put more budget in it. That is why we are not making much uh, progress. Uh, if you go to the US, uh, you will see the link between science and business all the time. You will see just outside every uh, good university, you will see uh, parks where uh, people who do research immediately move, move them across what uh, 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 Professor Garib has called the value of debt from the bench to the, to the market. So they crosses it. So when they go there, then the ideas are turned into something that becomes uh, a business proposition that can uh, make money. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is this kind of thing that I believe the tripartite can help us achieve. So we are, we are a scientist, believes that if he does research, it's not just to get fame, uh, because fame doesn't pay school fees of children. Uh, it is the money you make that will help you pay your children's school fees and do also other things. Uh, so the people can remain here, know that their research can be converted into uh, something, a product that can go and get into the market. Um, uh, if we don't offer that opportunity, they will go to the markets where those things are offered. And invariably they are uh, in um, Europe or America or Asia or other places where research uh, the, the academia, the, the public and the private are linked. And when you begin to see, the government will begin to see opportunity for tax. So they will invest more in research. Uh, so that's why we have that confluence of, uh, of um, interest. Uh, and uh, we will begin to see more investments in research. We will not get it because people love research. It will be because there is money coming out of it. Thank you, Prof. Uh, 
Let me take the next batch of questions. So there's a comment here from Pardon Kuipa. He says, I don't agree with the issue of globalization. Africa should be selfish and protect its budding and fragile industries from external competition. Uh, and uh, Talib uh, Sadiq says, how do we balance affirmative action policies with keeping skills, especially the previously disadvantaged communities? Um, keeping skills, I think, again, it's how we create the appropriate ecosystem and we recognize the talent. Unfortunately, this is still not happening on the continent. We are losing uh, many of, of our talented Africans. So our, our responsibility as leaders on, on this continent is to encourage the, the setting up of the appropriate ecosystem to nurture precisely what Professor Orama has said, uh, to nurture these ideas so that they cross the valley of death and get to develop into a business enterprise and create jobs. But for, it, for, for this to happen, there's something which we have to, to, to look at very carefully is the entire intellectual property framework. And again, this is where we are weak because this is one of the reasons why patents are not being registered on the continent. As mentioned, we record on, on average 0.1%. And we know that uh, patenting and IP protection is a tool for wealth creation. And who says wealth creation creates jobs? So uh, the spillover is tremendous. But we need to be able to, to systematically be creating that ecosystem so that we can attract the talent and also attract the interaction with the diaspora. And they are a huge uh, resource which we neglect. So they should be able to leverage their links, their connection with Africa to nurture this fledgling unit, which, which we have at our disposal and which need to be leveraged. Because I keep saying, we talk about Africa youth as being a boom, but you know, it can become a bane if you do not handle it properly. So we have a huge responsibility of nurturing that fledgling, that talented, that tech savvy youth that we have at hand, and we need to, to see to it that they thrive and they flourish. Uh, let me take uh, some more points here. Uh, Abiodun Aderi says many breakthrough science inventions are archived, I think, in the shelf of university rather than this. Rather than this. Research can be linked with private sector for commercialization. I'll take that as a comment. And then Africa Makassi says, commercialization IP is perhaps one of the key challenges in African science and tech institutions. How can this challenge be solved for the benefit of the young creative students who invariably get uh, frustrated by the absence of uh, commercialization? I think South Africa has some very good examples. And this is, I think, within the FCFTA, we need to showcase what is going on in terms of best practices on the continent. I think all universities, all research universities should have a full-fledged IP unit that can actually help address uh, the, the novelty in the research and then uh, prevent the publication. But before that, uh, kind of file in the patent and protection of the idea. And uh, so this is a way also of generating new innovative ideas, new innovative practices, but then it become a, a, a tool for wealth creation. So there are many examples in South Africa where all the, all the departments, they have an IP unit and the ideas have to be registered there. So we, we can try and probe there. Okay. All right, thanks very much. Uh, they're talking in the background here. Um, let me take uh, some more comments as well as uh, questions. All Africans must uh, be- Can I say something about this? Can I say something about this? Go on, Prof. Go on, Prof. Uh, uh, thinking, uh, just extending uh, what uh, uh, Prof has said. Uh, you see, one other thing is that we have a very, very, uh, what I say, um, very, very, very small venture capital space in, on the continent. Uh, the, the funds we have are rather the private equity funds. We do not have venture capital funds. You, uh, they used to be there, they don't disappear literally. Um, so if you don't have venture capital funds, uh, uh, it becomes difficult to take the IPs to commercialization. The, the, the people who know how to invest in those high risk, high return uh, ventures are not there on the continent. So one way is either probably government driven or 
yeah, we, we find other ways to make sure we begin to uh, revive the venture capital industry on the continent. I think that that will help uh, move uh, science up the value chain uh, to commercial products. Thank you. There's quickly something I wanted to just quickly add as well. Uh, okay. Over and above the venture capital, uh, there is also uh, the angel funding and also the culture of giving, the culture of giving by through philanthropic means. And this is one of the reasons why we've had Facebook, because the idea uh, from a university graduate actually got the funding from a philanthropist to go to Palo Alto and register uh, the company. So this is again something that needs to be uh, looked at with the private sector in Africa, that they can be part of this scheme of donating so that we can transform the ideas of the young people into enterprises, into businesses. So definitely angel funding, venture capital, and all these are very, very important ways uh, to address this deficit. Thank you, Your Excellency. I hope all of you in your good hearts will uh, pardon me for bringing what has been a lively and educative, educative, educative session uh, to an end. As I said, there are so many questions, hundreds of them, and I'm unable to get through, through to all of them. But I am hopeful that they will be shared and that uh, these insights, these thoughts, these comments will be shared widely across the African continent with fine ways in which uh, we are able to put them to good use. So I move on to our next session now, and I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Sarah B. Erno Ayang Agbo, who is uh, the African Union Commissioner for Human Resources, Science and Technology, uh, where she was uh, elected in 2017, her sector, uh, covers uh, education, youth and capacity development and science and technology appropriately, as you will see. Now, before she was elected, she was uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of Research, Cooperation and Relations with the Business World of West Region of Cameroon. There, she promoted research efficiently and effectively. Uh, she managed the university's educational and research programs, as well as overseeing initiatives and action plans in the university's research strategic plan. Therefore, she's the perfect person to deliver our guest uh, speaker role. Professor? Her Excellency, Professor Amina, Gurif Fakim, former president of the Republic of Mauritius, His Excellency Professor Benedict Rama, president of the African Export Import Bank, Afrizim Bank, Excellencies here present, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I bring you greetings from the chairperson of the African Union Commission, His Excellency Dr. Musa Fakim Mahama. It is with great honor that I join you all in this fifth edition of Dr. Ndiaye annual lecture. We extend appreciation to His Excellency President Benedict Rama for hosting this lecture under the theme, The Importance of Science, Technology and Innovation in the Transformation of African Economies under the AFCFTA. We all know that science, technology and innovation are critical enablers for economic development and that mainstreaming policies in our development agenda to support research and innovation becomes very critical, especially for our countries in Africa. This narrative is well outlined in our people-centered and long-term Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, that charts the transformative paths for inclusive growth and sustainable development of our continent to empower us to collectively deliver on the rising aspirations of the African citizens and the world beyond, including the global sustainable development goals. Africa is the second largest continent and takes about 6% total surface area of the earth and 20% of its total land area. Africa's population is equivalent to 16.64% of the total world population. The continent is surrounded by seas to the north northeast and north and southeast and west. Africa is the fifth largest forested region in the world and a home to specular and significant biodiversity, ecosystems 
abundance of natural resources, flora, fauna, wildlife, terrains, and minerals, among others. We have significant oil and gas reserves. Africa's enormous agricultural potential is vast and untapped. Indeed, Africa is an El Dorado, and yet Africa is facing a myriad of socio-economic development challenges. We host most of the least developed countries, LDCs, that are disproportionately affected by all known development challenges, such as over-reliance on exploitation of natural resources without value addition, huge energy deficit that hinders industrialization, perpetual food insecurity and malnutrition, poverty and inequalities, pandemic diseases, adverse impacts of climate change, escalating population growth and unemployment. It is true strong and functional science, technology and innovation systems that Africa can tackle these challenges systematically and spur sustainable economic development, wealth creation, and well-being. There are no shortcuts. Hence, the need to move the continental strategy to mainstream science and technology for economic development cannot be overemphasized. The Commission promotes the creation of an enabling policy environment for harnessing science technology and innovation on the continent. In this wise, we created a specialized technical committee on education, science and technology to periodically engage with ministers in charge of these critical sectors and to take collective decisions for mainstreaming SDI, R&D in our development agendas. We also created a committee of 10 heads of state and government as champions of education, science, and technology. Furthermore, we elaborated and adopted three distinct strategies for education, which is the Continental Education Strategy for Africa 2016-2025, the Technical and Vocational Education and Training, and training that is the Continental TVET, and the Science, Technology, and Innovation Strategy for Africa, that is commonly known as TESA 2024, to drive human capital development, youth empowerment, productivity, and economic growth. These strategies are designed to break down barriers that create fragmented systems on the continent through strengthening coordination and addressing weak levels of investment in education, research, and innovation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Science Technology Innovation Strategy for Africa 2024 fosters social transformation and economic competitiveness through responding to the demand for science, technology, and innovation across various socioeconomic sectors. CISA's priorities aim at eradication of hunger and food insecurity, prevention and control of diseases, protection of our space, and promotion of wealth creation, living together, building the society and communication. Furthermore, it promotes building and upgrading research infrastructures, enhancing professional and technical competencies, innovation and entrepreneurship development, as well as creating an enabling environment for STI. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the African Union Commission is fully aware of the crucial role of the national, regional, and continental institutions, both private and public, as well as the financial institutions in the implementation of STISA 2024, both in terms of technical and financial capacities. We need to own our research and innovation agenda. Our scientists and practitioners should also demonstrate the practical value of STI to our policy makers, to our societies, and address our development challenges so that we can unlock the most spoken investment of 1% GDP to R&D. Our mass media should step up the advocacy to press the case for STI on the continent. I believe 
that the only way we can achieve the Africa we want is by investing on education, science, technology, and innovation. The world in this 21st century is far advancing. We speak of e-health, e e-commerce, e e-trade, e-education, etc. And that is why the place of STI for the development of Africa cannot be negotiated. Moreover, young people need to be encouraged to take up careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and be encouraged to be creative and innovative. And that is why the Continental Education Strategy for Africa 2016-2025 has one of the thematic clusters as STEM, a second one as ICT. It is in this wise that we need to re-evaluate and reimagine our education system in Africa in order to make sure we consolidate science, technology, innovation for the Africa we want, that vision of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa driven by its own competent and skilled citizens able to play in the global arena. I thank you. Uh, Professor Sarah Anyang Agbo, thank you very much uh, for those comments. Absolutely vital. And I think they answer some of the questions and comments uh, that we have had uh, on the session today. Sadly, and I have to say sadly, and I say it sincerely, I have to leave you on the wider world of the world. But on CNBC Africa, we're going shortly uh, to closing bell, uh, South Africa. But in the meantime, my colleague, uh, Adesia Anyawoko, is going to take over and uh, she will continue with the rest of the program. We thoroughly enjoy hosting you here on CNBC Africa and we're certainly also playing our role by the way in terms of disseminating that information about the importance of our STEM subjects and also the importance of our innovation on the African continent. Until next time goodbye from us but the conversation continues and those comments are certainly going to be shared all around the world on Afrex Bank's uh, social media platforms. Thank you very much for watching today.